So I'm going to start as um, and introduce Dr. Fink. So Dr. Jordan Fink is uh, one of our uh, Speakers today, he's going to talk about development licensure and emergency use authorizations for preventative vaccines uh, from the FDA's perspective. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us, Doran. Um, he is a graduate of Stanford University and received his MB MD PhD from the Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and then did fellowship in infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins and has been an adjunct uh, assistant professor at George Washington University, but he has been with the FDA as a medical officer and now a deputy director uh, since 2010. And maybe Doran, you could give us a quick, you know, couple minute overview of how you ended up doing what you're doing related to vaccinology. That would be great sure. for the group here to hear. Right, so it, it, it really is one of those serendipitous career twists and turns. I, um, I trained in, in pediatrics and then pediatric infectious diseases and uh, had research background in, in first bacteriology for my, my PhD and then uh, parasitology and uh, in vitro diagnostics for my fellowship research, but really wasn't interested in pursuing uh, a career in, in laboratory research uh, and was getting toward the end of my, my pediatric infectious disease fellowship, trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do, uh, potentially uh, trying out full-time clinical medicine for a while. Um, uh, but then one of my, my close friends who had finished her hematology oncology fellowship uh, a couple of years before me and had gone to work for the FDA uh, working on oncology drugs, uh, had noticed that they were advertising for uh, positions in, in the Office of Vaccines for, for medical officers. And I had absolutely no uh, clinical training uh, in vaccinology or uh, in, in vaccine uh, development trials, but thought my infectious disease background might be relevant. And so I, I went and interviewed and was, was actually pretty uh, impressed with the, the, the nature of the job and uh, the, the types of, of projects I'd be working on. And so I uh, decided to give it a try. Uh, it didn't hurt that they, they paid pretty well uh, compared to what I might get in academic medicine. Uh, at the time, and I think that's still the case. Uh, and so I, I started as a medical officer uh, reviewing um, investigational new drug applications and, and licensure applications for, for vaccines and related products. I was promoted to a team leader uh, after about two and a half, three years and uh, oversaw uh, a team of, of four to six other medical officers. And then uh, eight years into it, which is about two and a half um, years uh, ago, I was promoted to, to deputy director and now I oversee all of the clinical uh, review aspects for, for vaccines and related products. Thanks, thanks for sharing that with us. I think it's important for everybody to know not everyone gets where they are uh, through the same pathway. And so we're excited to hear what you have to share with us today. Thanks for being here. Great, thanks. So I'll get started. And uh, I know uh, you've heard talks about clinical trial design and uh, phases of development. So I'm gonna try to tailor this talk toward the, the regulatory ins and outs and, and how we think about things at FDA. Uh, I know that for a lot of people, uh, and certainly this was the case for me, uh, considering employment with the FDA, nobody teaches the, the regulatory aspects of, uh, of drug development, it, FDA can, can often seem like a big black box. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to um, unshroud some of the mystery ar around that, that black box for you. Okay, so the, first just to, to set the ground rules, um, there are statutes, so laws uh, that have been passed that establish the legal authority of, of FDA to regulate 
vaccines and, and of course, all of the other investigational drugs that we regulate. Um, and the, the relevant uh, laws date back to the 1930s and, and 40s and amendments that have uh, been added to those laws over the years. Uh, the laws are, are not very specific. And uh, so therefore, uh, there are regulations that FDA has, uh, has developed that are really responsible for implementing the details of the laws. And all of these regulations are are contained in the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, which we call the CFR. Uh, these are searchable online in case uh, in your careers you ever get a comment from, from FDA or someone else referencing uh, the regulations. Regulations are legally enforceable, so they have a binding effect on both sponsors and the FDA, uh, sponsor being anyone who has business in front of the FDA. So we have to follow the regulations and uh, people who or, or entities for whom we have regulatory oversight have to follow the regulations. Uh, but the regulations don't uh, delve into every specific situation either. And so uh, for more detailed uh, information on how things should be done and also to allow FDA to adapt to evolving science and make sure that our current thinking really reflects uh, best practices and, and principles, we have guidance documents. The difference between guidance documents and laws and regulations is that guidance documents are not legally binding. They represent the agency's current thinking uh, on the issues that aren't covered in adequate detail by the regulations. Uh, we can depart from what's outlined in the guidance, but we have to have good justification to do so. Uh, and of course, the, the individual reviewers can't just decide on their own that, uh, you know, this. Um, bit of the guidance document is, is worthless and we're gonna abandon it. Uh, there has to be careful uh, supervisory oversight and concurrence anytime we make a departure from the guidance. Uh, and then in addition to all the laws and regulations and guidances, FDA also uh, gets help in its regulatory decision-making from the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, uh, otherwise known as the Verb Pack. Uh, Dr. Edwards has served on this committee, so she, she knows it well. Uh, this is a committee composed of experts that are external to FDA, not, so not FDA employees. It is convened upon request by FDA, and the committee is charged with evaluating data and advising FDA on the safety, effectiveness, and use of vaccines and related biological products, uh, and to help FDA in making decisions uh, uh, prior to, uh, say, granting uh, a licensure or emergency use authorization of a new vaccine. Uh, sometimes the VRPAC will also meet to discuss more general topics uh, that don't involve uh, licensure decisions, uh, but are of, of critical interest to advancing regulatory science. And the recommendations of the VRPAC are uh, non-binding, but they're usually followed by the FDA. So to boil down what the, the laws say uh, about vaccines and, and actually uh, and any other drug that FDA might license, uh, it's these four points. Uh, have to be safe, uh, they have to be pure, they have to be potent, and they have to be manufactured consistently according to good uh, manufacturing practices to ensure that in perpetuity they will continue to be just as safe as, and effective as they were demonstrated to be in the clinical trials that originally supported their licensure. And how does one get to demonstrating that a, a vaccine is uh, safe and effective? Well, this is done through studies conducted under an investigational new drug application or IND. Uh, the reason for the IND is that federal statute prohibits introduction of unapproved drugs into interstate commerce. And an IND application to FDA is uh, effectively a request for an exemption from the statute, allowing this investigational drug uh, to be uh, entered into interstate commerce. The primary function of the IND is to ensure protection of human research subjects. 
and it's required for clinical investigations of unapproved drugs uh, that are uh, carried out in the US. Now, an IND is not required when the drug manufacturer shipment and clinical studies occur entirely outside of the US, meaning no interstate commerce. So uh, if a vaccine is being manufactured and studied and developed uh, entirely in a foreign country, then an IND is not required. However, that being said, foreign vaccine manufacturers uh, who are conducting their vaccine development studies outside of the US often choose to develop their products under IND because uh, they benefit from FDA advice. And particularly if they're seeking to uh, have their products licensed for use in the US, then developing them under IND ensures that the FDA agrees with what they're doing every step of the way and there are no nasty surprises at the end of the line when they come in for their licensure application. An IND submission, which you might during your careers uh, 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 submit um, uh, or prepare, uh, contains three broad areas of information. So it describes uh, the manufacturing of the investigational uh, vaccine uh, and how the, the product is characterized. It contains non-clinical data from animal studies uh, to support the safety and sometimes a proof of concept uh, for the vaccine. And then finally, and, and most important to all of you and also to me, uh, the IND submission uh, contains clinical information uh, such as the protocol for one or more studies, uh, information about the investigators who are overseeing the studies, and also prior experience with the vaccine uh, to support uh, the proposed studies. Uh, when an IND application is submitted, the sponsor of that IND has to wait 30 calendar days for FDA to review it before initiating the proposed clinical trial. And FDA will review that application to ensure uh, for early phase studies that it is reasonably safe to proceed and for later phase studies uh, to ensure that not only is it safe, but it is adequately, the study is adequately designed uh, so that it is a scientifically sound and ethical study. Uh, and if uh, there is a problem with safety or if there is a, a serious problem with study design uh, for later phase studies, uh, FDA can institute what's called a clinical hold. What a clinical hold does is it prevents uh, the studies from proceeding until all of the issues um, are satisfactorily resolved. So this next uh, uh, diagram demonstrates the, the various phases of clinical development, which I'm sure uh, you're aware of. Uh, the IND uh, phase uh, starts really with phase one, uh, but relies on data that are, are generated in the preclinical phase in order to support the phase one study, and then progresses uh, to involving larger numbers of subjects uh, and more statistical rigor uh, through phase two and phase three. Uh, typically following phase three is when uh, approval of a licensure uh, application is uh, considered. And then of course there are additional studies that continue post-approval, uh, which are commonly uh, described as phase four, that continue to evaluate safety uh, and effectiveness in very large uh, numbers of, uh, of individuals or uh, in individuals who were not included uh, in the pre-licensure clinical development program. Uh, the main takeaways at the bottom uh, is that safety is paramount throughout the clinical development process uh, and a manufacturing consistency and effectiveness um, are evaluated uh, with increasing uh, focus as clinical development progresses. In order to facilitate uh, uh, development and advise sponsors, uh, FDA uh, has opportunities for formal meetings at various stages uh, throughout clinical development. Uh, the one that I want to emphasize most strongly here is the pre-IND meeting, uh, which occurs before uh, the IND submission, which is typically before phase one, 
although sometimes phase one occurs uh, outside the US, not under IND, and then the uh, IND submission uh, is uh, involving a phase two uh, or even a phase three study. Uh, but typically, uh, when an IND is starting at phase one, uh, FDA offers a meeting, which is really a, a free consult uh, to discuss uh, what is known at that time about uh, the product and the manufacturing, uh, non-clinical data that have been generated, plans for additional non-clinical data uh, to, to be generated to support uh, clinical development, and then, uh, and then high-level plans, uh, again, typically for the phase one protocol. Uh, if you are uh, thinking of sponsoring uh, an IND, uh, you know, even for an academic study, I would strongly urge you to consider um, submitting a, a request for a pre-IND meeting so that you can receive FDA advice and make sure that you're on the right track and avoid uh, any unexpected issues that might lead to a clinical hold of your IND submission. As, aside from the pre-IND meeting, uh, there is uh, typically a meeting at the end of phase two called an end of phase two meeting, uh, which is to discuss clinical development up to that point and make sure that everyone is in agreement uh, that uh, the, the product uh, development is ready to begin phase three and that the phase three study is adequately designed uh, to support licensure if it's successful. And then following phase three and before submission of a biologics licensure application, uh, we typically have a pre-BLA meeting. Uh, again, to discuss uh, the re uh, results of the phase three study and also to go over the plans for what will be in the biologics license application, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, these are the most common formal meetings, but there are also opportunities for additional meetings, uh, some of them formal, some of them informal, uh, throughout the uh, vaccine development process. And FDA can provide um, advice uh, in, uh, in any of these meetings. So a couple slides now about what FDA expects to see uh, in terms of data to support uh, licensure of, of a new vaccine. Uh, in terms of safety, uh, we need to have good characterization of common uh, adverse reactions, for example, fever and injection site reactions uh, and other uh, types of systemic uh, reactions. These can be characterized usually among several hundred study subjects. Uh, but then in addition, we like to or we need to see uh, assessment of uncommon adverse reactions that, that even though they're uncommon, they may be uh, clinically very significant. Uh, and our assessment uh, of these adverse reactions typically requires a safety database of at least 3,000 subjects. Why 3,000? Because uh, that number provides adequate power to detect events that occur at a rate uh, of one in a thousand individuals or higher. Now, it may be that we require on occasion a larger safety database if there are specific concerns that arise during clinical development uh, and we suspect that the uh, rate of, of those events of interest um, are uh, much lower. So an example is, is intussusception with rotavirus vaccines. And in clinical studies to support our current rotavirus vaccines, the safety database was in the 60 to 70,000 range in order to adequately characterize the risk of, of intussusception. We also uh, might request a larger safety database for vaccines that have highly immunostimulatory novel adjuvants to look to see whether uh, those adjuvants might precipitate autoimmune conditions. Um, aside from the uh, size of the safety database uh, that is needed to actually uh, assess safety, it might, uh, in some circumstances, turn out to be much larger than 3,000 simply due to the number of subjects that are needed to adequately power the efficacy analysis. So if a, an infectious disease has a relatively low attack rate and you need to enroll 20 or 30,000 subjects uh, in a clinical trial just to get enough cases to look at efficacy, then you'll end up with a safety database of 20 to 30,000 and, and all the better. In terms of evaluating effectiveness, 
FDA expects substantial evidence of effectiveness derived from adequate and well-controlled clinical studies. And the gold standard for substantial evidence of effectiveness from adequate and well-controlled clinical studies is the randomized controlled trial. Uh, the randomized controlled trial design mitigates the risk of bias by balancing potentially confounding factors across treatment groups. Uh, these trials are typically double-blinded to further mitigate the risk of bias. And uh, pivotal trials for vaccines uh, are often not just randomized controlled trials, but single, large, multi-center, and even multinational uh, randomized controlled trials. These pivotal trials are typically conducted in a study population that reflects the population intended for use of the vaccine once it's licensed. Uh, the trials involve pre-specified primary and secondary endpoints uh, that designate a clinical case definition or sometimes an immune response uh, that predicts uh, uh, protection conferred by the vaccine. And these trials will have prospectively specified a statistical hypothesis testing, uh, especially for the primary efficacy endpoint. This uh, hypothesis testing will evaluate a success criterion uh, that is typically based on the lower bound of a statistically appropriate confidence interval around the point estimate of vaccine efficacy. And that confidence interval should be uh, clinically meaningful and therefore uh, typically well above zero uh, for a single trial that is intended to demonstrate efficacy of the vaccine. There are three licensure pathways that you may have heard of uh, by which uh, FDA can approve uh, uh, drugs, including vaccines. Uh, these pathways all have the same requirements for demonstrating safety uh, but they differ with respect to how effectiveness is demonstrated. And the three pathways are traditional approval, accelerated approval, and animal approval. Traditional approval is, is called traditional because it was uh, the, the, the first pathway uh, that, that FDA um, uh, ever used. And in this pathway, clinical trials provide direct evidence of effectiveness against a clinical disease endpoint. Uh, this can be done in a field trial showing protection against natural disease. Uh, and this is the, the most uh, common uh, um, uh, example of, of clinical trials to support vaccine effectiveness. Um, however, uh, one could also demonstrate uh, efficacy in a challenge trial where uh, individuals are intentionally uh, infected uh, with the pathogen of interest under highly controlled conditions. We have an example of a licensed vaccine, uh, Vaxcora, uh, which is a cholera vaccine, uh, where the primary evidence for effectiveness was, was provided by a challenge trial. Uh, and then sometimes we have enough information about the uh, immune response that predicts uh, protection against a disease that simply showing that the vaccine elicits that uh, protective immune response is enough uh, to satisfy the uh, 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 demonstration of effectiveness to support traditional approval. Uh, these situations are uh, not the norm and they require that uh, an immune marker has been scientifically established to predict protection against the disease of interest. Uh, independent uh, of the, the vaccine platform. So here are some examples of uh, effectiveness endpoints that have supported traditional approval of vaccines. Uh, we, for, for clinical endpoints, we can go back to rotavirus vaccines and prevention of rotavirus gastroenteritis uh, in those clinical trials. For hepatitis B vaccines, we have an example of an immune marker uh, anti-hepatitis uh, B surface antigen immune globulin, where a concentration of greater than or equal to 10 milli international units per ml has been scientifically established to predict uh, protection against hepatitis B virus infection. And then for uh, uh, human papillomavirus vaccines, 
We have licensed those based on demonstration of prevention of pre-cancerous lesions, uh, which are, it's a clinical endpoint, but not the uh, clinical disease endpoint that is uh, directly reflected in the, the vaccine's indication, um, but uh, it is a necessary precursor uh, to cancer, uh, which is really what the vaccine uh, is protecting against. The second uh, approval pathway is accelerated approval, and this pathway is applicable to products that are intended to uh, treat or prevent a serious or life-threatening disease or condition and that provide meaningful therapeutic benefit over existing treatments, existing meaning anything that is licensed. Uh, so most infectious disease vaccines would fall under the category of products intended to prevent a serious uh, or life-threatening disease or condition. And so then uh, the question is whether the, the vaccine uh, being considered for licensure provides some benefit over uh, already approved vaccines. If there are no vaccines that have yet been approved against uh, the disease or condition, uh, then of course, any vaccine that provides a benefit uh, would provide a meaningful benefit over existing uh, vaccines. So under the accelerated approval uh, pathway, effectiveness is demonstrated using a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And for vaccines, uh, this reasonably likely surrogate endpoint is most often uh, uh, thought to be an immune marker that has not uh, yet been scientifically established to predict protection against disease. Again, if it had been scientifically established, we'd be talking about traditional approval, not accelerated approval. Uh, as an example, um, opsonophagocytic antibody responses elicited by um, pneumococcal vaccines have been used to support accelerated approval uh, of specifically uh, Prevnar 13 for prevention of pneumococcal pneumonia uh, in uh, elderly populations. And uh, the uh, effectiveness of Prevnar 13 against pneumonia as a clinical disease endpoint was then demonstrated uh, in a post-licensure study, a large post-licensure study uh, in, uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, the third uh, FDA licensure pathway is called animal rule approval. And this pathway is for products that are intended to treat or prevent, again, serious or life-threatening uh, conditions that are caused by exposure to lethal or permanently disabling uh, biological, chemical, radiological, or nuclear substances. So these are, are really products that are intended to be medical countermeasures. Um, like accelerated approval, uh, we're operating on a reasonably likely standard for the animal rule pathway. The difference being uh, that the entirety of data to support the effectiveness of, of the vaccine comes from animal studies rather than from human data. And animal rule approval is applicable um, only in situations um, where the product cannot be approved based on either of the other uh, licensure pathways. So this means that it's not feasible to conduct adequate or well-controlled trials um, after natural exposure, and it's unethical to deliberately expose uh, humans to the agent uh, in, in a challenge trial. And furthermore, there is no uh, immune marker or other surrogate endpoint uh, that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Um, otherwise, accelerated approval would, would be the way to go. Uh, under the animal rule pathway, effectiveness is demonstrated in animal models, uh, typically in challenge studies using the animals. Uh, and then there are clinical studies to assess safety uh, and then also to allow selection of an effective dose in humans. And for vaccines, this is done via comparison of the immune response in humans to the immune response in animals that was associated with protection. This is a process that's known as immunobridging, and I'll discuss it a little bit more uh, later in my presentation. Uh, so we, we only have one example of a vaccine approval under the animal rule pathway, and this was for post-exposure prophylaxis use of anthrax vaccine. In this example, uh, efficacy was demonstrated in rabbits and non-human primates that were vaccinated and then challenged 
uh, with anthrax. And then human immune responses in, in clinical trials were shown to be comparable to the immune responses in protected animals. Both accelerated approval and animal rule approval, as I mentioned, operate on this reasonably likely standard. And therefore, uh, they require post-licensure studies to verify and describe the clinical benefit. For accelerated approval, these post-licensure studies are usually underway at the time of the approval. Um, they have to be adequate and well-controlled and they have to be conducted with due diligence. And that example that I uh, mentioned earlier about the large uh, study to uh, confirm uh, effectiveness of Prevnar 13 against pneumonia in the elderly is an example of a required confirmatory study following accelerated approval. For animal rule approval, FDA recognizes that the types of events that lead to exposure, uh, natural exposure to um, uh, these, these pathogens uh, are unpredictable. Um, and it's, it's not easy to, to design clinical trials to, to evaluate uh, vaccines in, in these types of events. So the con confirmatory studies for animal rule approval uh, must be conducted only when such studies are ethical and feasible. And furthermore, they can be observational field studies, i.e. They, they don't have to be uh, controlled. Uh, we've had some recent discussions uh, around the confirmatory studies for accelerated approval where we are willing to consider observational studies uh, to satisfy the, the confirmatory study requirement for accelerated approval, but they do have to still be well controlled. And a, a test negative case control design is one that has been uh, discussed uh, frequently uh, with uh, respect to uh, Ebola vaccines um, that, that uh, might be approved under accelerated approval. Okay. Um, there are other types of clinical trials that, uh, aside from the, the phase three uh, efficacy or immunogenicity trials that provide the primary evidence of effectiveness and also the, um, contribute to the safety database, um, that are uh, included often in, in uh, data to support licensure applications uh, or beyond licensure applications. Um, as an example of, of studies that are conducted post-licensure, uh, FDA may require an applicant to conduct post-licensure studies to further investigate a safety concern uh, that arises during clinical development. Uh, this is called a post-marketing uh, requirement uh, study. Uh, the caveat is that uh, FDA and, and CDC have access to very large healthcare claims databases. And if it's possible, uh, for FDA to itself uh, use those healthcare uh, claims databases to conduct uh, a safety study in the post-marketing period, then we won't uh, hang the responsibility um, on, on the applicant and we'll do it ourselves uh, because we have much more power uh, to investigate the, the safety concern than, uh, than the applicant ever could have. Um, even if safety studies are not required post-marketing, um, the applicant may commit to conducting post-marketing studies to further assess uh, considerations for either effectiveness uh, or safety, such as duration of protection or safety or effectiveness in specific demographic groups uh, that were not included in uh, pre-licensure trials. Uh, if there are questions about uh, manufacturing consistency that can't be addressed um, by um, analytical methods, um, FDA may require a clinical study to show that immune responses to the vaccine are equivalent across successive vaccine lots. And this is called a lot-to-lot -lot consistency study. It's a rather blunt instrument um, using a very complicated assay uh, that's called the, the human vaccine recipient uh, to, to evaluate manufacturing consistency. And as analytical methods are becoming uh, uh, more advanced, we're starting to rely uh, less and less on, on these types of studies. But uh, vaccines uh, are complicated products. Uh, some of them involve uh, you know, multiple components that are, that are very hard uh, to, to analyze um, or, or very hard to, to, 
to characterize analytically to, to demonstrate manufacturing consistency. Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll still be requiring lot consistency studies uh, well into the future. Um, other types of studies that, that might be needed to support a licensure application uh, involve uh, combining vaccines um, uh, either in a single injection or administering them concomitantly. And the important principle here is that um, especially if you're, you're introducing a new antigen to a vaccine that's already been uh, licensed and is already in use, or you're introducing a new vaccine into an already established immunization schedule and the, the infant immunization schedule is, is already jam-packed, it's important to show that addition of that new vaccine or, or new antigen will not interfere with the immune response to either uh, the vaccines that are already been used or, or to the new vaccine. And so uh, we uh, typically require uh, studies to, uh, to, to demonstrate a lack uh, of immune interference, looking at, at immune responses to the vaccines that are administered uh, at the same time, either in the same injection or in separate injections at the same time. Uh, and then uh, immunobridging studies. I mentioned this, this previously, uh, and the purpose, the general purpose of immunobridging studies is to demonstrate uh, that vaccine effectiveness under some new set of parameters is not changed uh, uh, in comparison to the effectiveness that was demonstrated uh, under the parameters of the, the, the phase three efficacy trial. Uh, so uh, oftentimes uh, we're dealing with a, a change in vaccine formulation or manufacturing process or dose or regimen or even the population. The vaccine may be initially um, uh, you know, approved for use in adults and then developed further in pediatrics. And it may not be possible to conduct a clinical disease endpoint efficacy trial, trial in the pediatric population uh, because the, the disease is just not that frequent in kids. Uh, and so that's where an immunobridging study comes in. Uh, and so uh, the way it works is you compare the immune response uh, uh, that's elicited by the vaccine uh, under the, the new conditions to the immune response elicited by the vaccine under the old conditions and show that it's statistically non-inferior. Um, and so examples of, of when this has been done, uh, I mentioned uh, inferring efficacy across age groups, you, you have demonstration of, of efficacy in adults. And then if you show that in pediatric subjects, the uh, the immune response is, is not inferior, and we can infer that the vaccine will be effective in, in the pediatric age groups. Uh, we've done the same thing across genders uh, for HPV vaccines, where they were initially approved for use in, in females based on prevention of, of cervical cancer. Uh, and then we used immunobridging uh, to support that the vaccine would be uh, effective in, in males. Uh, and uh, also uh, we can use immunobridging um, across demographic groups. For example, if the efficacy is demonstrated uh, in a uh, non-US population that is not uh, very similar to the US population, uh, we might ask for an immunobridging study that shows that the immune response in a population that, that really does uh, reflect the US population uh, is similar to the, the immune response in the, in the non-US population in which uh, efficacy was, was demonstrated. Um, I mentioned uh, pediatric development and use of immunobridging uh, to support uh, vaccine effectiveness in pediatric populations. Uh, and that brings me to the Pediatric Research Equity Act, um, which requires um, with submission of certain uh, licensure applications that either uh, those applications provide safety and effectiveness data for all pediatric age groups uh, from ages zero through 16 years, or uh, if that, those data are not available, uh, there needs to be either a request uh, for a deferral to conduct those studies later and provide uh, the data at a later time point, uh, or in some cases, a waiver uh, uh, of, uh, from conducting pediatric studies 
uh, for reasons that, that might be, well, the disease just simply doesn't exist uh, in, in those pediatric age groups, or it's just impossible to, to do a study uh, in, in the pediatric age groups. And th those would be uh, reasons to, to, to have a waiver. But in the absence of, of, a, of a valid reason for a waiver uh, or uh, a deferral, uh, these pediatric studies uh, have to be done. Uh, the pediatric studies can start at any time during clinical development. Uh, there's, no, there's no a priori reason why they have to wait until the, the vaccine is licensed for use in adults. Although typically we will require at least some preliminary data from studies in adults uh, to inform the safety of, of doing uh, clinical studies in kids, but also more importantly, to inform that there is some prospect of, of direct benefit uh, from the vaccine to uh, pediatric research subjects because that prospect of, of benefit is, is ethically necessary uh, to support the conduct of, of a pediatric research that involves uh, greater than, than minimal risk. Uh, pediatric studies often age de-escalate starting with adolescent age groups and then progressing down to school age and then infants and, and, fine, and toddlers. Um, and I, I mentioned the, the ethical considerations already. I want to spend the last three slides uh, talking about emergency use authorization uh, because this has been in the news uh, very recently related to COVID. Uh, emergency use authorization um, was established in one of the amendments uh, to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, uh, and what it allows for is for FDA to authorize uh, either an unapproved medical product or to authorize an unapproved use of a previously approved medical product to address a public health emergency related to uh, certain threats. And uh, an emergency use authorization requires a prior determination uh, that the threat exists and a declaration of circumstances justifying the need for the emergency, emergency use authorization to address that threat uh, by um, one of the secretaries of either Homeland Security, Defense, or Health and Human Services. And for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we got that declaration from uh, Alex Azar, who at the time was the Secretary of Health and Human Services. That was uh, a little more than a year ago. Um, so the criteria for emergency use authorization are fourfold. First, uh, that the agency referred to in the EUA declaration by, uh, in this case, the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. We know that to be true uh, for SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19. Uh, secondly, um, the medical product um, must uh, or th there must be evidence to, to demonstrate that the medical product may be effective uh, to prevent, diagnose, or treat the serious or life-threatening disease or condition uh, caused by the agent. Uh, and complementing the second criterion is the third criterion, that the known and potential benefits of the product outweigh the known and potential risks of the product. And if uh, any of you were paying attention uh, to the verb pack meetings that we had um, around emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines, you'll remember uh, that these second and third criteria are very closely linked in FDA's considerations of, of data to support emergency use authorization of those vaccines because we are, uh, we, are we were at the time contemplating uh, uh, making available uh, very novel vaccines for use in millions, uh, tens, hundreds of millions even, uh, of, of individuals, including healthy individuals. And so therefore, the standard uh, in the criteria that the, the product may be effective um, in, in order to support acceptable benefit risk, uh, we considered really uh, should be much closer uh, to the standard uh, of substantial evidence of effectiveness that we would typically require to support licensure of the product. Um, and so the, the, these, these were the, the concepts that, that we discussed for emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, the fourth criterion for emergency use authorization is that there must be no adequate approved and available alternative to the product 
for diagnosing, preventing, or treating the disease or condition. Um, and even though this criterion includes all those words, diagnosing, preventing, or treating, um, it really is uh, specific to the intended use of the, the product under consideration for EUA. So for vaccines specifically, um, we look at whether there are other vaccines uh, that are already approved and available uh, for preventing, uh, in this case, COVID-19. And uh, as was the case for each of our three uh, emergency use authorizations issued to date, uh, there are no COVID vaccines um, that, that are FDA approved, and so this criterion is satisfied. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we outlined our expectations for EUA of COVID-19 vaccines um, uh, in detail uh, in October at a, at a VRPAC meeting, and we, we released uh, guidance uh, in October, uh, a little bit earlier in the month, outlining in detail uh, these considerations uh, and what we expect uh, to be included in any emergency use authorization for COVID-19 vaccines are first data to demonstrate manufacturing quality and consistency, uh, clear and compelling safety and efficacy data to support favorable benefit risk of the vaccine when rapidly deployed for administration to millions of individuals, including healthy people, uh, and then finally, plans for further evaluation of vaccine safety and effectiveness, uh, including in ongoing clinical trials, active and passive safety monitoring during use under the emergency use observation, uh, or sorry, authorization, and then also uh, observational studies. And these, these post-authorization assessments are critical uh, to ensuring that the data continue to support that the benefits of, of giving the vaccine to millions of people continue to outweigh the risks. Um, otherwise, um, the criteria for continuing the, the emergency use authorization would not be satisfied. Uh, and so I'm sure uh, most of you are, are aware that to date, FDA has issued three emergency use authorizations uh, for the Pfizer mRNA vaccine uh, and the Moderna mRNA vaccine uh, a week apart in December of 2020. And then more recently, uh, just last month, at the end of the month for the Janssen uh, adenovirus 26 vector vaccine. So that's uh, the end of my, my presentation. Um, I do have uh, at the end um, some uh, guidance documents that you can Google uh, and look up for, for additional information, in particular, if you're embarking on a, on a uh, clinical trial uh, career and you might end up sponsoring uh, an IND, the, the meeting on uh, or the guidance on meetings between FDA and sponsors, which includes information on pre-IND meetings, uh, would be uh, very And I'm happy to, to share my slides uh, with Dr. Lindsay Grisikoff and Dr. Edwards and they can uh, send them on uh, to you as well. But in the meantime, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very, very much. Maybe you could unshare your slides and we can gallery view the screen and that way people can pop on and ask some questions. Lots of thank yous and a lot of people who would love the slide set. So if you send them to Kayla, I'm sure she can get them to everyone. I have a question. Go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Helen. Um, junior faculty infectious diseases at the University of Washington. I um, thank you for your talk, it was great. I, my question is if you can provide um, some clarification with the immunobridging study. So um, in your slide, you say that we can do the immunobridging study to support a new dosing schedule. And um, I guess my question is more specifically with the HPV vaccine, for example, if we, doing a study or a trial to see the um, the efficacy of a single dose of the HPV vaccine, do you need for the endpoint, uh, do you still need to look at that, in this case, surrogate endpoint, uh, the, the high grade lesions, because we don't have a um, specific um, serologic correlate uh, with um, protection in with the HPV vaccine? 
Right. So, um, you know, for HPV vaccines are, are an example where we used immunobridging uh, to support a two-dose regimen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, we would, you know, in general, consider uh, immunobridging as uh, potentially supporting um, a, a one-dose regimen, although I, uh, I think, you know, you really need to get into what the data actually show. Mm -hmm. uh, whether those immunobridging data would actually support a one-dose regimen, and uh, we, um, you know, we 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 worry about things uh, like uh, not only the um, the height of the immune response, but but the persistence of the immune mm -hmm. response. And those, are, those are all factors that, that need to be taken into account in in designing uh, uh, an immunobridging study. So then you need to still follow them for longer, three or whatever many years uh, for duration as well. Then okay. no, I'm not. I'm not saying that that subjects need to be followed, but but there there needs to be data to support that whatever immune response that you're you're measuring, um, uh, you know, following your your new regimen um, will will behave similarly. Uh, to the immune response following the, the established regimen. Okay, thank you. There needs to be a ba there needs to be a basis to to believe that there won't be um, significant or clinically significant differences. Thank you. Very helpful. Hi, thank you very much for your your presentation. Again, it was great and very informative. And Martin Becker at NYU. Uh, following up on the conversation of immunobridging studies, I know that the FDA has given some guidance in terms of what we would expect, for example, on the HD escalation for children, but I, I'm going to admit that I haven't gone over all of it, and I'm going to take the advantage of, of you being here and asking, since I don't know that we have a perfect correlate of protection for, for these vaccines and COVID-19, what, what is the FDA going to be looking for in terms of that, that immunobridging studies for, for the younger age groups? Yeah, so that, that's a good question, and it, it reminds me that I, I, I didn't mention this during my talk, um, but it's, it's not a requirement to have a scientifically established immune marker that predicts protection uh, to use that immune marker uh, in immunobridging studies. So an immune marker that, that, um, that is used in, in immunobridging studies need only be an immune marker that, for which there is a basis to believe that it's telling us enough uh, about the immune response to the vaccine to be sufficiently clinically relevant. Um, and so uh, for, for COVID-19 vaccines, uh, what we think we, we need to look at in the absence of, of a scientifically established uh, predictive uh, immune marker is something along the lines of, of neutralizing antibody uh, responses, both in terms of, of geometric mean titer and then also some, some type of zero response definition. And by looking at those, those two parameters, um, which look at two different points on, uh, if you can imagine a reverse cumulative distribution curve of immune responses uh, to the vaccine in a population, um, the, the GMT and the zero response rate um, will together uh, uh, paint a, a pretty complete picture of of, of how the immune response is looking in a population. And so then by, by comparing those two parameters uh, between the adult population in which efficacy has been demonstrated and the pediatric population, uh, that, that could allow for immune bridging. Got another question if nobody else wants to go first. Um, with regards to uh, data, you know, studies done in the U.S. versus abroad. Is there any uh, strong preference or guidance or, or requirement in terms of accepting uh, data from, from studies done abroad? Right. So we, you know, FDA has a whole uh, section of our regulations and then also uh, guidance. And it, the, the guidance is, is included at the end of my, my presentation um, on uh, studies conducted outside the U.S. And really what it, what it boils down to is that the studies have to meet our usual regulatory standards. They have to be adequate and well-controlled 
and they have to be conducted ethically. Uh, so in the US, that means that they're overseen by an institutional review board uh, that ensures the, the ethical conduct of the studies. Uh, uh, other countries don't necessarily have institutional review boards, but they have uh, similar bodies that are called independent ethics committees. Uh, and so if the studies are conducted under an independent ethics committee, that will, that will satisfy the, the, the FDA requirement there. Uh, and then the other uh, consideration is, um, you know, does the study population uh, for a study conducted outside the U.S. Uh, sufficiently resemble uh, the, the population in, in the U.S. for whom the vaccine is intended? Or are there potentially important biological differences um, where uh, the data from the non-U.S. study might uh, be of questionable relevance? And that's the situation uh, where we might ask for an immunobridging study uh, and you know, some safety data in, in a dedicated U.S. population. I had a quick question regarding EUAs, uh, if that's okay. We, since we've hit so many new EUAs for the COVID vaccines, I'm wondering how that transition is going to occur when some of these start to get full licensure. Are they going to, I mean, I'm presuming that they don't lose their EUA authorization as soon as another vaccine is licensed, but I'm also presuming that no new EUAs can come through if there's something already approved. Have we plotted out how that's going to happen yet? Well, uh, <laughs> no, we, we have. We haven't plotted out uh, in, you know, in definitive detail, but the, I think that the principles are all laid out in the, in the laws uh, that, that I went over in my slides. So um, the, the criterion that you're talking about, that fourth criterion, is whether there are adequate approved and available therapies, right? So let's say that the, let's say that the first uh, COVID-19 vaccine is approved. Um, well, it may be approved, but there may not be sufficient quantity of that approved vaccine uh, to, to vaccinate everyone who, who still needs to be vaccinated. Or it may be approved, but there, there may be uh, circulating variants of concern uh, that the vaccine is not adequate to address. And so in each of those situations, uh, we would still be in the condition where we're meeting the criteria uh, for EUA. Now, if we have um, enough COVID-19 vaccines uh, that are approved such that the supply is sufficient uh, and the vaccines are, are adequately covering the variants that are out there, then we might consider, well, does, is that fourth criterion really uh, being met or not? And if it's no longer being met, if there is adequate approved and available vaccine out there, then uh, that might be grounds to terminate the emergency use authorization of, of other vaccines that have not yet be, been approved. But then, of course, there are other political considerations that would likely need to be taken into account as to the timing of, of, uh, of those actions. Thank you. It helps to think through it that way. Thank you. Well, we're at the top of the hour, and I just wanted to thank Dr. Fink for joining us today and providing us with a great talk. And for everyone, uh, I'm sure we can get you the slides. We appreciate your time. We appreciate everybody being able to join us and ask insightful questions. Um, and I think we'll sign off then. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>